What's the hardest part about the pipeline? I hear combat dive, and I'm familiar with Key West Mm because I was on a Merops team and failed pull week as a young staff sergeant in (laughs) in third group um, and decided to go the mountain phase because I I was better off in the mountains than I was in the water. Um, That seems to attrit a lot of people. What overall was attriting people, and what did you find the most difficult? So it was just – it was uh, a selection uh, because – Pararescue selection is a water-based selection. Mm. Uh, so you do all the land stuff, but you're spending anywhere from four to six hours a day in the pool. Oh, wow. Doing drown proofing. And I mean, uh, everything. Practicing that, for the for the CQ or for the actual combat dive. So pool? it's essentially, think of pararescue selection as a pre-dive course. Oh, wow. yeah. Right. So okay. it's like Bud's phase one. Yeah. PJ selection, kind of the same thing. Um, you have to meet all of the Navy dive standards coming out of that pre-dive selection. So all the drown proofing, the buddy breathing, the knots, the ditch and dawn, like all that stuff. And mm-hmm. so coming out of PJ selection, CDQC was not that big of a deal. Yeah, because you had already been through all of the yeah, and the, the standards gates. the standards at at selection were higher than the selection than the standards at CDQC. Oh wow! So okay. it was like okay, well you've already done this. Yeah. Uh, so at that point it was. It, it, I mean, it was hands down. You're the checking the selection block piece to get was, through it and come yeah. dive. And it was it was fun. Selection was fun mm. in a way, in the way that things that suck are fun. Yeah. Uh, so it was fun, but it was also it was something that was so binary, right? You either did or did not swim 50 meters underwater. Yeah. I mean, there, and and there's a certain there's a certain kind of like Zen like mindset that comes with binary standards where yeah. you either do or do not do. You either do the pull ups or you don't. You run the time or you don't. You do the sit ups or I you don't. It. Right. It, there's there's it. something just so kind of calming yeah. because you know exactly what it is that you have to do. And as long as you do that, you're good to go and don't quit. Yeah, uh, and that was another thing that was interesting was watching people who were smarter, faster, and stronger than I could ever hope to be, quitting. Yeah, they had probably wouldn't have made it, but they just they quit. Yeah, the beauty is as you distill that into the bottom of the funnel, you're surrounded with men who are yeah. not only like minded but characteristically the nearly the same human being with yeah. all the with, with all the similar traits that you want what year did you go through selection and then what does the 10 year run look like for your, your career field so i was uh uh balls 397 for selection is my class mm-hmm. uh so pararescue has three or selection at the time right i think things are completely different so anybody who wants to go into pararescue like don't listen to what i'm saying right now because i'm sure it's completely different but they had three selection classes a year Went through that, went through the whole pipeline, CDQC, Halo, Jump, um, you know, PJ School, the whole nine yards took about a little over two years. Got your got to our team. And then it was it was really interesting because it was Clinton years. Mm. So I mean, the first time I saw combat was in nineteen ninety eight. Mm. I was deployed into southern uh, into Kuwait and then we were going into southern Iraq. Mm. And so people don't realize that the special operations community was used a lot during the Clinton years. A yeah. lot. Yeah. Right. You had Northern Watch, Southern Watch, uh, was it Operation Desert Fox, Desert Thunder, right? All those ops All that those were going small on. Skirmishes. Yeah, but there yeah. was never anything like constant, yeah. right? And there was a lot of a lot of boredom. Uh, but the cool thing about pararescue was the budgets are virtually unlimited. So it was just constant training. So even though there wasn't wars going on, I was still jump trips, dive trips, jump tip. Yeah. You know, the, the, uh, the jump and dive trip to, you know, Hawaii over Christmas for all the single guys. Right. I mean, that, that's the kind of, it was, it was, it was pretty awesome. Um, working with everything from ODAs to SEAL teams to, FBI, HRT to the secret service, right? Just kind of constantly in the mix and all these different things. And one of the things that people have to understand about pararescue is an organic pararescue team outside of the CSAR mission doesn't exist, right? There's not 12 pararescue men who go somewhere, right? You're always embedded with somebody else. Mm. And there's a, a an, an interesting advantage to that because you're the air force guy. Mm-hmm. Right, so you better you better perform in the top at least twenty five percent of mm-hmm. any team that you get attached to. Otherwise, they're going to kind of look at you as not being an asset to the team. Mm-hmm. And because you're ripping out with different teams every you know ninety ish days, so you'd be with an ODA and you show up, and guess what? You're the Air Force guy mm-hmm. until you prove yourself. And uh, you know, 
30, 45 days in, it's like, all right, Air Force, you're, you're all right, mm -hmm. right? And then the team really trusts you and now you're becoming a real asset to the team and now you rip out, go through a training cycle, now you're getting hooked up with a SEAL team and guess what? You're the Air Force guy. And so you had to always stay on top of your game and it was a real driver to, to put in the extra reps, to, to try to be the, the best version of yourself that you could be and be the best PJ that you could be. And you also had to learn to get along with people. Mm. And you know, one ODA is doing one thing and then another ODA does something completely different. And this ODA tells you that what that ODA is doing is unprofessional and vice versa. And what I kind of learned through all of that is that it actually didn't really matter as long as what you were doing was effective and safe and fast and you were good at that, then it, it really didn't matter. So I would see every, like one team was dedicated high ready. One team was like, high ready is the most unprofessional thing ever. You're gonna be at a, you know, at a depressed low ready. And, and you're getting all of that within 180 days mm. of deployments. Mm -hmm. So your ability to be cognitively flexible and learn what that team was doing and then just kind of be a chameleon and, and, and just meld into their SOPs was, was a, that's probably the most important, uh, asset that a PJ can bring is just the ability to just show up and shut up and, and learn incredibly rapidly so that they can be an asset to the team. Yeah. Fine work. Yeah. Being adaptable. You, so w where did you recognize? Cause there's a, there's always a perception that often becomes a reality with how things are going to be because you see the brochures, you hear all the stories. Mm -hmm. Then there's the reality of what it actually is. And then there becomes moments where you're like, oh, this is what this is. Mm -hmm. And you know, like I remember going through the Q course and I went to the Q course during the uh, invasion of Afghanistan, but remembering watching all the things unfold and thinking I'm missing out and then envisioning I was on the back of a helicopter in combat operations in Afghanistan. And then I remember the moment where I actually was in the back of the helicopter with right. a beard in Afghanistan with an ODA going, oh, I'm here. This right. is it. And then being in my first gunfight going, oh, this is what this is about. Was there a, a moment where you recognize like, okay, th this is why we exist like most people have in special operations? So there's, there's a few, but believe it or not, it was actually during a civilian rescue in mm. the Sandia mountains. And so interesting, uh, the, because when you're a PJ again, like you embed with an ODA, you're not in charge of a damn thing. Yeah. You're, you're an enabler a, for that. Yeah. So like you're, yeah. you are to, you are to embed in that team and be an absolute asset. And there are times when that team will look to you, but it's not like that team is looking to you because they don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. They're looking at you to do your job and they're gonna go do their jobs, yeah. right? And that might just be pull security while you work, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever the case may be, but it's it's something where uh, you're in an environment with like-minded, well-trained people who all know what their job is. You've been training together, you've been working together. And so you know how things just kind of like, they just work. Yeah. It's hard to explain, but they, it just it just all happens. Now add civilians. So you train civilians. Mm -hmm. Let's say that the, there is no standard to being a civilian. Mm -hmm. And so I was the pararescue representative of the Mountain Rescue Association, uh, which basically meant when the Mountain Rescue Association, Association in, Me in New Mexico, and I should back up, I'd been voluntold at this point to go to the PJ school and be the mountain rescue and ropes instructor and weapons instructor out there. So part of one of my additional duties was to interface with the civilian rescue community because pretty much any PJ team has that person mm -hmm. who who interfaces with everybody in Colorado, it would be the county sheriff right up here as well. But in New Mexico, it's the state police or the mountain mm -hmm. rescue association. And so I was on a rescue. It was actually ended up being fire and rescue uh, magazines, rescue of the year. This guy was climbing and uh, was about 30 feet up a cliff and got uh, a, his arm trapped in a boulder. And the civilians had tried to deal with it didn't really kind of know what to do. They called us. Uh, so we showed up fire service, then starts showing up. State police starts showing up and all these kind of rescue assets start showing up and nobody's in charge and just kind of complete chaos. 
Meanwhile, this guy's getting compartment syndrome and they've got a surgeon in route that they're flying in to do a, to amputate his arm on the side of a cliff. And they're asking us like, Hey, can you set something up so the surgeon can work on the side of a cliff? No problem. That's an easy day for us. <laughs> and so, but all day long, but part of me is like, yeah, I'm not going to let that happen. We're going to get this rock off this, off this guy's arm. We're going to get him down. We're going to save his arm. I don't know how I'm going to do that yet. But we're going to save his arm. So we start, uh, start drilling into the rock, putting bolts into the rock and actually set up a, uh, a hull system. Cause we're going to try to like lever this rock off a little bit. Well, I don't know if you've ever seen ropes when they're reaching their, uh, kind of their plastic breaking strength, but the knots will actually start getting little trails of smoke that come out of them and oh, it wow. starts snapping. It almost sounds like, it almost sounds like uh, direct incoming fire, right? Yeah. You get that snap. Uh, that's the rope starts snapping like that inside the knots. And so we started pulling on this rock, uh, massive boulder, and the knots start snapping. We see smoke coming out. I'm like, okay, well, that's a problem. So I get some fire service guys to start bringing up lifting bags. But their lifting bags can't can't lift this rock either. Yeah. So... Uh, I get them to start bringing this up, this stuff up and they get there and everybody's looking around and nobody kind of knows what to do. Mm. And meanwhile, I've got a civilian paramedic who we had lowered down to put an IV in this guy because uh, compartment, compartment syndrome is a like compartment syndrome will kill you. It'll throw you into uh, a cardiac, yeah. give you a cardiac issue. And so we started getting all the right drugs in him and stuff. And, uh, the civilian paramedic is kind of out of his element and I start coordinating everything. And then these state police people start kind of talking to the fire guys and the fire guys are talking to the state police guys and the mountain rescue association guys are talking there. And, uh, one of my guys is trying to coordinate a national guard helo that's coming in and all this stuff is happening. And finally I just was like, wait a minute, this is why I've been told to do this additional duty. And so I finally stood up on this rock and I was like, hey, I was like, I have control. Mm. And everybody just looked at me and was like, like nobody fought me on it. Yeah. And uh, they're and like, thank I God was, somebody. Yeah. Like and I was like, all right, you do this, you do this. We got all this done. And I'm standing on this rock and this civilian paramedic is, I mean, he's pretty freaked out uh, because we finally lifted this boulder. Uh, but one of the pieces of shoring on the boulder slipped. And so now this rock is basically dangling on knots that are very clearly coming close to breaking. And so I was on this little ledge and I finally, I was just, I'm not roped into anything. Uh, I was wearing a harness, but it wasn't tied into anything and didn't really need to be. It was a safe enough situation. It was a ledge probably about as wide as this, this table. And so finally I just walked over this paramedic and I just grabbed onto him and pushed him away from the rock. And I started walking down with him mm -hmm. and people were like, what the heck is this guy doing? But you'd had so much training in pararescue and so much experience that that might seem dangerous yeah. to these civilians. But to me it was like, yeah, this isn't really that big of a deal and ended up ended up getting this guy to the bottom, uh, ended up getting that rock set down on some, uh, some four by four shoring and ended up saving this guy's arm. The guy pulled his arm out. Yeah. So, so we, we got the rock off and so we were able to get his arm out. As soon as we got his arm out, he went unconscious, right? Cause all that acidotic blood hit him. Oh, gosh. Uh, he went unconscious. So now we're like, well, is he like a fibbing out yeah. on the freaking side of this cliff? Like nothing we can do about that. So that's why I, I just, jumped on him, pushed him out and was like, all right, we're, we're going down and we got to get this guy down as fast as possible. You started working him. Yeah. I started working him when we got to the bottom. Um, uh, he, he's, he stayed unconscious until we had about a mile walk out. Uh, and he started kind of coming to about a mile in, but he was, I mean, for the most part, fine ended up saving his arm. Crazy. And so that was the issue in instance where it was like, Oh, wait a minute. Like this is, this is why I'm here. Cause a lot of times you're like, why am I here? Yeah. Right. You're with an ODA for two weeks. Nothing happens. You kind of aren't really needed. Yeah. Right. But then there's a couple of guys who are, you know, pending medal of honor, um, PJ attachments to some ODAs for some stuff that happened in Afghanistan. You're probably familiar with some of those ops where it was like, okay, there's now a very, very clear reason why they were there. And I think that's one of the, one of the differences between pararescue and a lot of the other special operations community as a, as an SF operator, 
and with your time in JSOC, you always knew why you were there, mm. right? There was a very specific mission. Yeah. With pararescue, you only are really needed when things go wrong. Yeah. And it's part of one of the reasons I wanted to transition over to the CIA. It was like all we ever did was crisis management. I kind of wanted to see what the crisis prevention side looked like. 